what was a video game and then became a TV show called The Last of Us. I learned about this when I was uh, sitting in my couch at home answering emails and just watching TV. And I began to get emails from people that saying, hey, were you one of the advisors to the, <laughs> to the show? And I said, what are you talking about? So I went and looked at it, and that's how I saw the trailer. And uh, so this show has to do with the idea that a fungus changes, a cordyceps type of a fungus becomes mutant and is able to take over people, take over their mind and turn them into, into zombies. And how is it connected to my work? Well, I've been working on why are the fungi pathogenic for a very long time. So I was always fascinated by the question that people are afraid of viruses. They're afraid of bacteria. They're afraid of parasites. When they go to malaria, they take prophylaxis, for example. But people don't seem to fear the fungi. The fungi may, may harass them. They may give them a nail infection. They give them athlete's foot. But people don't walk around saying, you know, I'm really worried I'm going to die of a fungal disease. You're right. Right? And that's different. If people are worried about viruses, et cetera. And, and to me, that was a very interesting question because the plants, the fungi are the major pathogens of plants. So plants are terrified of the fungi if they could think. The insects are terrified of the fungi. The frogs are terrified of the fungi. So the question is, what makes us different? And one thing that really makes us different is we are really warm uh, relative to our environment. And, and we don't think about it, but our temperature, what we walk around every day with, is enough to keep out most of the fungal world. Mm. So we're getting a huge amount of protection from just okay. being... 37 or 98 degrees. And, and, and what does our internal body temperature do to keep keep them out? It's it's it, it, basically they can replicate at our temperatures. Got they it. Are, so here is the big concern. The big concern is the fungi are, are adapted to life Got on it. Earth that is cooler. And if they adapt to higher temperatures, they they will defeat our or or our temperature barrier. Because if you have a fungus that can grow, let's say, let's use the Fahrenheit scale, above 95 degrees, well, it's not pathogenic today. But if in two or three years it can go to 98 degrees, well, right. you're not going to keep them out. Speaking of life adapting, and this was news to me, but I didn't realize that our body temperatures are actually getting a bit cooler. That is an incredible result. Uh, and it was done... Um, it was a, a very interesting paper uh, in which it, what they did is they collected temperature readings for decades, going back, you know, over 100 years now. And they showed that the average human temperature is dropping. So, in other words, your great grandparents were warmer than you are. Mm. So how can that be? After all, you know, we are the same species. Well, right. it turns out that 100 years ago. People were infected with a lot of things that they're not infected in our clean world today. They had worms. Many of them had tuberculosis. Even if it was latent, it would raise your temperature possibly. And they, anyway, they lived in a different world that where there was more inflammation. Inflammation is why when you, when you get an injury, it feels warm. Right. That's exactly what, what's kind of what's going on. So in a more inflammatory world, they had higher temperatures. Our world is cleaner. But this leads to a problem because if the fungi are adapting and we're getting yes. colder, we're going to meet earlier than we think. Okay. We're going to keep talking about some of the things that, at least to me, are, are freaking me out as we talk about this and something that I wasn't tuned into before and and let's finish this off before we talk about what implications are of all of this but one of the other things is that it's it's climate change is not only making some of these fungi stronger it's actually helping them proliferate so where we are today and where we are tomorrow just on a volume basis could actually be quite different that is correct you know temperature is one thing that changes everything you change one degree and you change the metabolism in the soil, you change the metabolism everywhere. As life adapts to a higher temperature, we're going to be beginning to see new phenomena that were not known before. Some of it we can readily explain. Like for example, as, as the north gets and the extreme south gets warmer, organisms move up, insects move up. So we're going to see the changes in diseases in things that we can explain. 
What worries me is the unknown. Something mm -hmm. like Candida Oris, unknown to medicine, and then right. shows up and you have to deal with it. Okay. Um, there are human body temperature implications that we're talking about and what it could actually do directly into the human body. But there are other life forms that are out there, including our food supply and other things. So it's not just impacting us as human beings, but I imagine for other living things on the planet, there are going to be implications as well. You're absolutely right, Paul. It doesn't make the news, but the fungi are destroying entire ecosystems today. Mm. For example, we're living through, in our lifetimes, we have seen an amphibian catastrophe. A single fungus has spread throughout the world and has killed untold numbers of frogs and driven many to extinction. In North America, we've seen a problem with the bats. The bats were well till 2006, and then a fungus got into, into this country somehow. Right. Yep. Uh, that causes white nose syndrome. The bats are like you. They are 37 degrees in the summer. They are resistant to this fungus. But in the winter, there are no insects. They need mm. to hibernate. So their temperature drops and this fungus kills them. Millions of bats are being killed. And every major crop has a major fungal pathogen. So the wheat have a fungal pathogen, the rice have a fungal pathogen, you name it. And agriculture fights a constant battle with the fungi just to make sure that we have our food at the table. Uh, so this is obviously an area that is of tremendous importance to society. I mean, maintaining the food supply. Uh, and you there, one of the complications, Leah, that happens there is that the compounds that are used to control the fungi in the field can, can give you resistance to some of the fungi that are in the field that cause human disease. Let me repeat that. You're treating your, your, your crop but this stuff is being spread all over the soil. Mm. And in that soil, there are some fungi that cause human disease. So you're essentially selecting for resistance in that. So I think, again, is that we need to look at this as a, as a global whole. Whatever we are doing, is it agriculture, the bats, the frogs, us, and, and understand these connections. Okay, one of the things that um, you talk about in your book and you just referenced it, is that the medical world is not either not paying much attention to this or not talking about it very much, or we're, we're not hearing it. Is it one of those things or all of those things? Well, I think it's all of them. I think that the, look, the medical world is up to its neck in problems. Yes. Right? I mean, we just went through a pandemic. What are we sitting here? We're worrying about H5N1. There always seems to be something more present in front of us. Right. Uh, so the fungi, they tend to, you know, to be pushed off the radar screen. But the, but the one thing is, when you look at the numbers, the problem of fungal diseases gets worse every year. We have more immunosuppressed people because medical progress often comes at the price of immunity. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you save a person's life with a transplant, that person becomes immunosuppressed. Right. So now it is at risk for the fungi. So I think that, you know, I'm glad you're having me here. I'm glad that I can talk to your listeners because I think the number one thing we need to do is raise awareness. Now, there are drugs that are out there, but you indicate that these historically are becoming less effective. That's right. Resistance, like everything else, continues to be an increasing problem. And, and as I alluded to earlier, the fact that we are biochemically so similar to the fungi, what it means is that it is difficult to find a difference. And if, you, and if it's a difficult to find a difference, the difference is the target. You want to kill the fungus and not kill the person. So what happens is it just, it's harder uh, to do so, but things can be done. And I will tell you, the, the pharmaceutical industry and people are rising up to this, new drugs are in the pipeline, but I think that, that the efforts needed are much greater than the efforts that we have on the table. Okay. There are also some implications of certainly some serious side effects of some of the least of some of the current antifungal medications. Well, our best antifungal was made on the year that I was born. Uh, it's known as amphotericin B. If you want to know my age, 1957, I was born. 
And the drug was known for many years as Amphoterrible. Okay. Amphoter now, over the years, physicians have figured out how to make it less toxic. But it, it tells you something that the, the most effective of, uh, drug that we have for some fungal diseases, we now have others. We have azoles, we have the kinokindins and things like that. It's a, it's a drug that was developed a long time ago with a lot of toxicity. 